All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nandan Nariker, Assistant Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Columbia University. And welcome to this month's installment of Columbia BME's Faculty in Focus series, where we spotlight exciting research conducted by our Columbia BME faculty. These lectures are all available on our BME YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Columbia BME. Uh, throughout the presentation, if you have questions for our speaker, please type them into the Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to the questions then at the end of the lecture. Um, with that, it is my virtual pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the esteemed Dr. Henry Hess. Uh, Dr. Hess is a professor of biomedical engineering here at Columbia and director of the Lab of Nanobiotechnology and Synthetic Biology. Uh, and with that, I'll hand things over to Professor Hess. Thank you, Nandan. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here. Let me see if I can work the controls. So, are we looking good, Professor Nehoka? Yes, looks great. Excellent. So, yes, it's my great pleasure to introduce the work my lab has done, meaning my students, my postdocs, me and my collaborators have done over the past 15, 20 years. And to set the scene, let's talk about this movie alone for a moment. So here you see a microtubule assembling from tubulin proteins inside a cell. And you see this kinesin motor protein as it walks along the microtubule and pulls a vesicle from the center of the cell to the perif periphery. Now this movie is showing the wrong things in many different ways, but you can already appreciate from that what a beautiful nanomachine this little kinesin motor protein is. So it takes, for every step it takes, it takes an ATP, hydrolyzes it into ADP and phosphate, and generates a work with very high efficiency. And when I started my postdoc with Viola Vogel and Jonathan Howard, they had this brilliant idea to say, Let's take this little molecule, this little nanomotor, and see if we can build robots out of that, some sort of um, nanorobot. What, can, what could we do if we have uh, molecular motors like this um, motor protein? And now you can ask, well, why would I want to do this? And one could say, well, there's the efficiency aspect. It's a very efficient little energy conversion mechanism. But my answer goes back to ecology here. So on the left, you see a graph of the population density as a function of the body weight for different animal species. And you can appreciate that there's roughly an inverse relationship between the abundance of various animals and their size, which is intuitively obvious for every human, there are a billion mosquitoes. Now, my credit student, my former credit student, Megan Armstrong and I, we put together a similar plot for motors and engines. And again, you find that there are many small motors and a few big ones. And Historically, it started with the first steam engine, which weighed a few tons. And, and then over time, we made bigger and bigger machines, more and more of the medium-sized ones. But we also went to the, to the left and up, meaning we made more and more small motors. And if you look at the car, it started out with one big engine. Nowadays, a car has over 100 motors, most of which are very small and do small tasks, which are never, nevertheless worth doing. So the future is to the, to the left and the top, tiny machines and many of them. And one way to power these machines is, for example, by taking molecular motors and putting them together to generate um, 
microscopic and macroscopic forces. And so that's what we are trying to do in my lab. Now, if you look how many motors there are, they're actually catching up with the abundance of, um, of animals, but that's a slightly different story. Now, another interesting fact about motors is that if you plot motors and their force output as a function of their mass, then on a, and you do this for all different kinds of motors. And that's something Martin and Alan did in a PNAS paper from 2002. Then you find that they all sort of fall onto one, more or less on one line in this log log plot. For every, um, the, the ratio between the force output and the motor mass is almost fixed from the tiniest molecular motors like the kinesin motors down here, all the way up to giant rockets. And so there, something determines how much force you can get out of a motor for a given amount of mass of the motor. And that's something we just got a grant for from the biomathematics program of the Army Research Office to figure out where this close relationship comes from in collaboration with Professor Tara Katira from San Diego State University. So we're very excited to delve more into this universal relationship. Now, what we do in the lab though, is we use these kinesin motor proteins and the microtubules, and we extract kinesin motor proteins from um, E. coli, or rather we ask nicely the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies at the Sandia National Lab to ship us some extracted kinesin motor proteins. We buy tubulin from a company which mashes up cow brains and pig brains and extracts the tubulin from these brains. And then we reassemble microtubules. And if you absorb um, the motor proteins to the to a surface with their with their tails down and their feet sort of sticking up, then they will move along and you add microtubules. The microtubules will stick to the kinesins. In the presence of ATP, the kinesins will walk along the microtubules and will push the microtubules across the surface sort of like in cloud surfing. Now, if you label the microtubules fluorescently, you will see under the fluorescence microscope, you will see these um, little worms, the microtubules, bright microtubules gliding across the surface. So you don't see the motor proteins here. They sort of form a carpet on the surface. You only see the microtubules as they Light. Now, the movies I'm showing are all time lapse movies. So, they, in real time, it takes about two minutes for the microtubule to cross the field of view. So, if you are very patient, you can see them moving. But all the movies I'm showing are like 30 or 100 times accelerated. Now, this undirected motion you see here is not terribly useful, but you can then combine. Um, the active motion generated by the kinesins with structures on the surface that, um, which you can microfabricate. So for example, on this surface, we made um, trenches on the surface and photoresist. And so these trenches force the microtubules to follow this spiral and they go all the way to the end of the spiral and turn around. So you can guide the motion of the microtubules. You can put linkers on the microtubules so that they will selectively bind to a specific cargo. And you can see that here in this movie where the microtubule picks up um, this little clump of microspheres mm -hmm. and moves it and then hands it over to another microtubule so you can carry cargo of the microtubules. And then by controlling the ATP concentration, you can make the microtubules start and stop. So in combination, you can make a nanoscale transport system, which we refer to as a molecular shuttle. And, and that's 
was in a large part my postdoc work to have um, done in the lab of Viola Vogel, who's now at the ETH Zurich, and which formed the foundation for a lot of the things we did afterwards. Now, one interesting thing you can do is you can make the microtubules sticky. And so if you do that and you have them glide on the kinesins, they can stick together when they meet. And you can ask yourself, what's going to emerge from that? And that's a very, and I'll sh show you now. So if you let the microtubules go, they will stick together. And they will form these long wires. And then when the tip of the wire catches up with the middle, they will form a spool. And then after a while, the wires, like if you watch this one, it, it collects a couple of other wires and then gets eaten by a spool. So you have patterns emerging. It's a non-equilibrium process. And you have very interesting self-assembly phenomena, which is something, something we started for a few years. Now, from another perspective, this is very interesting when you like to think about swarms and, and swarm behavior. Because if you look at ants, for example, obviously an ant is very stupid. It can only follow very few instructions. And you can see that in the experiment on the right where people put dead ants in a, in a bowl at the periphery of the ball. And now if you add a few live ants, the living ants will pick up the dead ants at random and drop them preferentially where there's another dead ant. So after a while, you see these clumps forming and which are referred to as ant cemeteries. And it's a simple example of how ants following simple rules can generate complex behaviors. So in short, ants are stupid and ant hill is very smart. And there's a parallel between this and what the microtubules are doing. Obviously, the individual microtubules are extremely stupid, but the question is how smart can we make a whole swarm of microtubules? And that's the type of question we're interested in. Now, the closest thing we've come to the actual application of these little nanotransporters is by trying to build smart dust sensors with support from the DARPA biomolecular motors program. And here you can see sort of the idea of this. The idea was that you would make these millions of little microchips, each one less than a millimeter in size. It would fall into some puddle, some whatever you're trying to detect in that puddle would seep inside that could be anthrax or TNT or whatever the Department of Defense is interested in. And inside the microchips would have antibodies on them. They would capture the analyte, then go into a second chamber where they pick up a tag with a second antibody, and then move that tag from the second chamber into the third chamber, where they, where the arrival of the fluorescent tags indicates the presence of the analyte in the first chamber. So let me show that to you maybe one more time from the beginning. So many distributed sensors, they, which could be targeted towards biomarkers like myoglobin as a marker of a heart attack or something in the environment. And now you're basically building a double antibody sandwich. You're, you're sandwiching the analyte between an antibody on the surface and an antibody, uh, an antibody on the microtubule and an antibody on the um, fluorescent particle. But in contrast to something like an ELISA, you're not washing solutions in and out. You don't need a pump, you don't need a battery for the pump. Here, you're only moving the, the molecules you want to move and the, the fluid stays where it is. So it's very energy efficient. And it's very simple, and it's almost what a cell does internally when it move, wants to move around um, various um, proteins or uh, subcellular structures. Now, what we actually built 
is not as fancy with just maybe one well, put microtubules with antibodies inside, put the analyte in so the analyte will be captured by the antibodies on the microtubules, put in fluorescent particles with a second antibody. And then when the microtubule moves, it will encounter the fluorescent particles, pick them up, amble through this well until it reaches the edge, and then get stuck at the edge, and they will all pile up at the edge. And under the microscope, then you can see the well, and you can see that the microtubules here in red sort of pile up at the, at the edge of the well. And if the analyte is there, they will carry these little nanospheres from the center of the well to the edge. And that's the indication that the analyte is there. In the control where the analyte is not present, you still see the microtubules pile up at the edge, but the, the, you don't see like a band of little nanoparticles. So it sort of works, but by far not good enough that you could see that from an airplane from 10,000 feet away. And so following that, we spent a good amount of time trying to understand what the shortcomings are. And one thing we try to understand better is what causes our molecular shuttles, our little gliding microtubules to fail. Because if you look at a machine design textbook, the first few chapters teach you how to make the machine work once. And then you get a few chapters on why does the machine break? Now, a modern piston engine like in a car can work for about a billion cycles. Your heart muscle also works for a billion or a few billion cycles, but it achieves that in a very different way. Rather than maintaining its function or having parts which last for that um, amount of time, the the actual motors in the heart muscle, the myosin protein, motor proteins, are replaced every few days after about a million cycles. But the heart replaces these components 10,000 times in your lifetime. And in this way, achieves the, um, this amazing um, long longevity. Now, the, the um, chemical molecular motors, which have been invented in the past couple of decades and have been recognized with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2016. When you use them to actually say a little cantilever, they last less than a thousand cycles. So how do we, in our structures, how do we determine the lifetime? What are the mechanisms which break down our molecular shuttles and how can we extend those? These are questions we've been pursuing. The first thing we looked at were the microtubules. And so we watched microtubules just as they're being transported by kinesin motors. And if you look very closely and make the very precise measurements, they shrink a little bit over time. And we found that they shrink from the tip and we found that the shrinking rate depends on the kinesin density. So more motors dragging on the microtubule can in increase the shrinking rate. And it also depends on the velocity of the motors. So if the motors take more steps or faster steps, the, the microtubules will shrink faster. And so that's almost like what happens to, to the tires in your car, right? So the more, um, the longer you, you're, you're driving your car, your car the, the faster the, the tires are shrinking. Now, a frequent collaborator of mine, Professor Akira Kakugo and his team, actually looked at what with high-speed atomic force microscopy at what is happening. And the picture which emerges from that is that the tip of the microtubule has sort of photofilament sticking out and when they meet a kinesin, which is not as active as the other ones, then that protofilament will get bent and break off. So there's continuously this breaking off of pieces at the tip of the, of the microtubule responsible for the shrinking. Now, 
just want to mention that not everything what the microtubule is doing on the surface is understood by us. So, for example, we recently found that sometimes the micro, microtubule glides across the surface and then suddenly decides to leave the surface. And we try to figure out if there's some obstacle or if there, or if there are motors missing on the surface or if the motors are damaged or something like that. But none of these things seem to be true. The micro, microtubule all of a sudden takes off fairly positive. Um, in this moment, I want to make um, a quick advertisement for a label-free imaging method, which was the um, which is widely used for cells, but um, has been only recently used to image microtubules, and that's interference deflection microscopy, and that has been um, suggested by the labs of uh, Jonathan Howard and Eric Schreffer. And the idea here is that you eliminate unlabeled microtubules from below, and you get deflection from the, at the interface between the cover slip and the water, and you get a little bit of reflection at the, inter, at the transition from the water or the buffer to the microtubule. And the interference between these two reflected um, waves will lead to constructive or destructive interference and will, will give you contrast. And Gardiel Saber, my a postdoc in my lab, has explored that a little bit more. And he can beautifully see unlabeled microtubules on a surface, as you can see here. He can see little obstacles, like pieces of dirt on the surface. And he found that it's actually nice to have label-free microtubules because they move about 20% faster than the la labeled microtubules, probably because the fluorescent label interferes with the interaction between the motors and the microtubule. But it, using this um, type of microscopy also didn't reveal why, why sometimes the microtubules are leaving the surface. Now, I mentioned that the microtubules are shrinking. They're also breaking sometimes as they're moving across the surface. And my graduate students, um, Juan Rodriguez, Stanislas Zitkov, Neda Asir Kazaruni, and our collaborators from Japan um, investigated that and we just published a paper on scientific reports about where we looked at how frequently microtubules break depending on their, their curvature. So if they're going fairly straight, there's a very low breaking rate. And if you bend the microtubule, it will break more and more frequently. And the interesting thing is that you can explain the observed behavior by um, simple mechanochemistry, basically the idea that if you apply forces to intermolecular bonds, the rate of unbinding will increase exponentially. Now, but what we would like to do at some level is to do what the heart muscle does and replace components dynamically. Get this turnover going where the protein serves a purpose for some time and that get, then gets released again and gets replaced by a new motor protein, for example. And my student, Amy Lamb, found a way to do this in a, one of these experiments where the microtubules are propelled by motors on the surface, by these penicillin motors on the surface. So instead of immobilizing the, the motors on the surface more or less permanently, she created a surface which binds the motors only very weakly. You, and what then happens is that most of the motors are in the solution. They will bind to the microtubule, the microtubule will put them on the surface, then get propelled by the motors, leave the motors behind, and then the motors will unbind again and return to the pool of motor proteins floating in the solution. And the way that looks under the microscope is very beautiful because here you see the microtubules labeled in with a red fluorophore, 
And to make the kinesin visible, we use GFP kinesin, which you see here in green. And so now as the, as the microtubules move across the surface, they build this little trail of kinesins underneath and leave the kinesins behind, and then they go back into the solution. And so you have this dynamic process where the, where the structure assembles itself and then um, continuously to, to maintain its, um, to maintain its activity. Now here you might ask, well, if the micro, can the microtubule maybe pick up on the fact that there's a kinesin trail already existing when it crosses it? Maybe we can get the microtubules to follow another, each other because the microtubules bind to the kinesins already on the surface and that one made the trail, maybe the other one will follow. That gets a little bit again into this idea of swarm swarming and swarm robotics. And there are different ways in a swarm to make the agents interact with each other. They can interact directly with each other. And then um, like, let's say in a swarm of birds, the birds look at the bird next to them and decide if they wanna follow it or not and where they should go. So that's a little bit like direct interaction between the agents. But you can also have your agent modify the environment and then the next agent gets its instructions from the modified environment and follows them. And that's a little bit what the microtubules do to the surface, right? The, the, the microtubules change the surface by depositing the kinesin. And then now we want to get the next microtubule to pick up on that changed surface and go where the first one went. And that's a little bit what ants are doing, right? The ants leave pheromones, the next ant picks up on the scent of the first ant, and before you know it, you have an ant trail where all the ants are going in the same direction. Now, my student Stanislav Tsipkov um, worked on that for a while, and in the end, he got it to a point where the kinesins go where the microtubules are, and the microtubules go where the kinesins are, and in the self-reinforcing cycle, you end up with these paths of kinesin and spontaneously emerging bundles of microtubules which walk on the kinesin. And it appears yellow because the microtubules are red and on top of the green kinesin and they overlay the two images so you get um, yellow greenish structures. And as you can see, the microtubules are looking at you and they create a clear intelligence. Now, I want to switch here for a moment and ask sort of more fundamental questions about um, motors and molecular motors. And one of those is if you have a molecular motor which is not doing work, let's say in a way our microtubule as it moves across the surface doesn't really carry anything, is it doing you any good? Can you, can you get something out of this? And that's an interesting thought experiment, which um, I first published in a paper on archive, and now it's out in the IEEE transactions of nanobioscience. And the idea is basically, imagine you have a microtubule, which is circular, and you have a little motor protein walking along the microtubule, and you're watching that motor protein as it walks along the microtubule. Now, at every step, it consumes energy, it consumes the ATP. It can pull a load if you apply a load, but you can also load, use it as almost like a clock, like the arm of a clock, and you can watch it as a, you can tell time based on how far it moved along the microtube. And so in this way, you get two things. You get the work done on the cargo and you get the information you can extract about the timing of the process. And if you put that together, I would argue you can, the change in the, um, in the free energy of each um, ATP, which is being consumed 
is turned either into work or into information, which is interesting to think about. Now, similarly, you can ask about sort of why the wider field. Do, you, do we even need a molecular motor? Uh, do we need a molecular robot? At the macro scale, a robot typically assembles something. It picks something up, puts it, let's say, in a car factory, it picks up the door of a car and attaches it to the body of the car. And after a while, we assemble the whole car. But at the molecular scale, you have diffusion. Your building blocks are diffusing around. You don't need to necessarily have a robot which grabs something and moves it somewhere else. It will go there eventually just by diffusion. So what the robot can do only is accelerate the movement. Now, one can think a little bit about how that precisely works. And the outcome of the analysis is basically that to double the speed of the assembly, the robot has to dissipate a certain amount of energy in it per assembly step. That's again, KT LN2, which goes back to the Landauer limit, which is a fundamental limit for computation. And I don't want to go too much in the details, except that we, to say that my postdoc, Gardia Sepa, investigated that in the context of microtubules gliding on Chinese motor products. So if you put take two microtubules and put them close to each other, and you, they have a little bit of free tubuling, they can connect and fuse end to end. So, so if you look, if you do this on a surface coated with penises and you just let them run around, once in a while you will see two microtubules come together and grow together. Now, what Gardner did was he, he did that in, in a little well, like in a, he created a, a chamber which is 50 micrometers in diameter maybe a micrometer high, put microtubules in there, sealed it from the top, now had microtubules of two different colors run around in that chain. And he counts how many fusion events he sees after, after a certain amount of time. And he finds that the microtubules which are confined in the well fuse maybe 20 times faster than they do when they're just moving on the surface. And that's an illustration how a robot accelerates a chemical reaction because what the action of the kinesium motors is doing is it pushes the microtubules to the edge, keeps them rotating at the edge, and thereby reduces the number or the increases their density and aligns them with each other. And that is what enables the reaction to proceed faster. And again, if we ask, well, how much energy would we need at minimum to move the microtubules to the, um, to the edge and then um, align them, we again get a value of 2 kT per microtubule, and that is very close to our prediction um, from the previous analysis of how quickly you can accelerate. And it's an interesting improvement over previous molecular machines, which were used to accelerate chemical reactions. Because in previous molecular machines, the, the reaction was the machine was first put together under tension so that you didn't need fuel to, to move, the, um, move the machine. It's, it's, it's almost like buying a mousetrap, which is already preset now. And then it will just, the moment it gets activated, it will move. Our system with the microtubules is, is a bit more sophisticated. It's, Disordered in the beginning, and it gets the action of the motors tighten the system. 
part of a longer discussion about molecular robotics, but um, you can read all about it in Science Robotics from last year. Now, I want to take a moment to highlight an accomplishment of um, some Japanese researchers, including Takahiro Mita, who is a former postdoc of mine. So they actually used kinesin motor proteins and microtubules and managed to build a little muscle in a way. Or, or by they can use light to pol polymerize microtubules and, and uh, or rather polymerize assemblies of kinesin motors, which then contract using ATP and actuate this little um, PDMS structure. So one can actually scale up the force of these molecular motors almost to the microscale. So we're doing a lot of work with nanoscale transport driven by molecular motors. We've also explored if we can maybe do away with the motors and get nanoscale transport just by gradients, for example, on a surface or in a volume. Right? Um, and I want to skip over many of the um, ideas in that. Um, the group of Paul Brown and at UAUC demonstrated that it's actually possible to use gradients and hydrogels to move um, molecules in a, in, in a directed manner. Our theory showed that the movement reaches velocities of um, a few hundred nanometers per second, so almost as fast as the transport by molecular motors. And it's an interesting question if intracellular transport relies not just on diffusion and active transport by molecular motors, but also by this flow induced by binding energy gradients. And the one example that may matter is when you start thinking about how enzymes come together to form metabolons and cells. So cells can be induced to, um, to form enzyme aggregates called metabolons, which comprise the enzymes in a particular pathway. And through their vicinity, the pathway gets activated. But the question is, why would they come together in one particular location? And my student, Henri Palacci, contributed the theory to his paper, Nature Chemistry, where he explained the, the directed motion of the enzymes as resulting from cross diffusion in the gradient of the of the substrates produced by the previous enzyme in the past. Very interesting mechanism, and I recommend it. But it's just one aspect of our work focused on enzymes and enzyme cascades. So in particular, we have been spending a lot of time looking at enzyme cascades where the first enzyme makes the product, which is the substrate for the second enzyme. And so for example, one can use the glucose oxidase, phosphatase peroxidase cascade, where the glucose oxidase makes hydrogen peroxide, which is then used by phosphatase peroxidase to make a colored product um, from a chemical called ABTS. And in a widely um, cited paper from Nature Nanotechnology, the group of Itamel Wilmer showed that if they put these two enzymes next to each other on a DNA scaffold, the output of the cascade is accelerated. And the interesting question is why? And the explanation was that it's because the two enzymes are close together. Now, from our work with, with the molecular shuttles, we knew that this explanation cannot possibly be true. So we, my postdoc, Kifei Sang, 
did a very interesting experiment where he just conjugated the two enzymes together next to each other. And he found that there was no enhancement. Um, and also that there's no inaccessible, um, that there's no intermediate um, molecules which are which cannot be accessed by, by a third enzyme, like catalase. So there's no direct transfer from one enzyme to the other. And the question then is, why would a scaffold, a DNA scaffold, accelerate the enzyme cascade? And Stanislav Zitkov's explanation was that, well, the DNA scaffold is very negatively charged. It creates locally a very low pH, if one of, uh, sorry, yeah, low pH, if one of the enzymes operates faster on a lower pH, you will get faster throughput. And Kifei Zhang then proceeded to actually demonstrate that uh, in, an, in an experimental system and um, highlighted the importance or the possibility to create a local microenvironment for each enzyme where locally for each enzyme the pH is optimized. And so we we did a lot of work with enzymes, discovered some interesting things in the process. So for example, um, if they discovered this um, green bottle experiment where the enzymes first produce green color, and then after a while, the green color goes away. So what happens here is that the at the bottom is the enzyme solution, which is separated from the surface, uh, from the air above by some oil. So every time you shake it, you introduce a little bit of oxygen into the enzyme solution, which drives the, drives the enzyme enzymatic reaction which then reverts. Now, if, if you're a physicist, you say, well, that's not terribly interesting because obviously you throw something up, it falls back down. But for a chemist, it's, it's a puzzling thing that you have a chemical reaction which goes forward and then backward again, instead of just approaching some equilibrium. So that's a very interesting system. And especially if you do this in a dish, this reaction drives very uh, interesting pattern formation processes. And you can read all about that in nature catalysis. And you can see basically that the, if you put some tracer particles in there, that this is related to flows emerging in that, in that Petri dish. But when then we got some feedback from um, other research groups who tried to reproduce this, and they found they couldn't reproduce it uh, easily. And Kife actually went out and dug into the reasons for that. And he found that the reason is that there are inhibitors in the substrate which can affect the enzymatic acid. So that depending on how much contamination you have on the pre, and he identified these inhibitors to be the precursors in the synthesis of the ABTS. So now, depending on how, how big the impurities are, your, enzy your enzymatic assay will work better or worse. And that matters actually because this ABTS is widely used for ELISA assays. And so this, this these contaminations in, uh, introduce some irreproducibility into the ELISA assays. And if they found that if you just do your, your ELISA at a temperature, uh, at a pH of four, 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 four point five, at that pH, the precursors will not bind to the, um, will not bind and the reaction will proceed at the same rate in every situation. So that's a, where this 
basic research into enzyme cascades then feeds back into something which gives um, practically relevant information for um, biomolecular assays, assays which are widely used in the clinic. Now, as I mentioned before, we, we sometimes do um, just modeling. So Stanislav Zipkov um, got his undergraduate degree at MIT, also in applied mathematics. And so he worked on explaining why compartments are actually helpful in cells. Why do cells make metabolic compartments? There was a previous publication on that, only very recently, for the first time that somebody actually put a mathematical model to this idea. Um, Dr. Zipkov did a simplified, but in my opinion, more instructive version of that where he could show how the, why you get an optimal, um, an accelerated production of, of certain products if you confine your enzymes in little subcompartments. I don't want to get too much in the details here. Um, let me maybe skip up over our work on enhanced diffusion, where we criticize the, the idea that enzymes um, are propelled every time they um, they turn over a, a substrate molecule. And just talk a little, for a moment about something which has become increasingly prominent in my life. And that's looking at um, single proteins as they do various things. So for example, we looked um, in a project started by Megan Armstrong and then continued by Juan Rodriguez. And um, we looked at how protein molecules absorb the surfaces. And we found that the, that the time between absorption and desorption is as a power law distribution. And in collaboration again with Peter Salomon and Paul Katira, we explained where this power law distribution merges from. And the explanation is that um, a protein absorbs to a surface, not in one single event, but it, it sticks a little bit, sticks a little bit more, sticks a little bit more. And in this, each substep in the absorption process is reversible. And this reversibility and multi-step character gives rise to the observed power law, which is a, again, a very interesting project. Now, Joseph Rubin, who is a BME student mentored by me and Ali Garavi from um, the medical school, and also Milan Stojanovic from the medical school is now taking this ability to look at individual proteins as they do things and applies it to, to trying to detect the glycosylation patterns of single IgAs or immune, immunoglobulins on the surface. So the idea here is that you bind antibodies to a surface. The antibodies are distinguished from each other by their by the presence of certain glycans, certain sugar chains attached to the hinge region of the antibody. And then one can see for each individual antibody if these glycans are there or not by targeting them with a fluorescently labeled probe like a Jacqueline molecule. And so if you watch the antibodies sitting on the surface. Over time, you will see events where we see a yellow dot where at the same time, there's a red molecule and a, and a green molecule. And from that, you can then infer how, hopefully, we're still working on it, how the glycan chains are distributed in different antibodies. So to wrap it all up, I've told you 
a little bit about our work on molecular robotics, on self assembly, on enzyme cascades, and gradient driven transport, and then also single molecule imaging. And I want to thank all my students and collaborators, first at the University of Washington, then at the University of Florida, and now since 2009 here at Columbia University. And our funding comes mostly from NSF and the Department of Defense and some foundations, and now for the first time from the NIH as well. So I want to end here and thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Great, Professor Hess, thank you very much for this very beautiful overview of your, your lab's uh, expansive and really interesting work. Um, so if there are questions, please enter them into the, the Q&A. Um, I don't see any questions there at the moment, but uh, we will give a few minutes if, if anyone wants to add some. Um, in the meantime, um, I'll ask a question. Um, well, I was trying to ask a question about liquid-liquid phase separation, but I'll, I'll, I'll spare you. Um, so the, the cell presumably has many exquisite ways of controlling microtubule assembly and disassembly and kinesin activity. I'm wondering whether there are some of these accessory proteins that the cell has that may be useful to sort of um, exploit in, in, in this engineered system that could give you additional functionalities if, if this is something you've considered. Yeah, it's, it's certainly, ten, so, so microtubules in, on their own are very dynamic entities which can grow and shrink and um, and we are freezing them in at a certain length by adding a, a drug called Taxol to them, which is a widely used as an anti-cancer drug because it disrupts the um, disrupts mitosis. And it is indeed an interesting idea to use other microtubule associated proteins to affect certain microtubule behaviors or certain rates of shrinking, growing, interacting with, with other things. We haven't done that too much yet. And our latest work actually sort of sh almost shows the, the opposite. When we were studying the breaking of microtubules, we showed that without any of these microtubule associated proteins, we found exactly the same mechanical behavior as you see in cells, which indicates that it's just the, the mechanics of the microtubule which determines the breaking of microtubules in cells rather than the microtubule associated proteins. And so it's, I would argue a goal for biomechanics against the biology. It's it's the mechanics. It's it's not the protein sticking to the cells. Now the breaking process in, in itself then has interesting um, consequences for the cell. So more breaking means more formation of microtubules and, and, and adaptation of the cell to to the stresses which caused the breaking of the microtubules. Very interesting field, um, not something uh, directly involved. Okay, um, so I don't see any additional questions. So I think with that, um, thank you again, Professor Hess. And uh, I'll just conclude by reiterating that you can find Professor Hess's seminar as well as all of the previous faculty and focus seminars on our YouTube channel where the link is shown here on the screen. Um, and with that, uh, have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Anandan.